Okay, so it takes very little of that. So ketosis isn't necessarily a goal or a marker of being a fat burner. But I do tend to agree with Kurt Harris in that I believe that the default metabolic state in our evolutionary past was being a fat burner, not a carb burner, for two reasons. One is just pure availability. And number two is for energy output, 96 versus 36. So it's very natural that uh, we would seek it and that it would be predominant in our diet and that, that would be our predominant metabolic default. Um, you know, if we took everyone in this room and we got in a bus and they dumped us out in the wilderness and said hunt and gather for a week, and then we come back and we did a macronutrient assessment of everything that we brought back, you would find that very little of the caloric content that we were able to get for ourselves would be carbohydrate, unless we just happened to hit that one two-week block at the end of summer, beginning of fall, when apple trees were in fruit or blueberries were blooming or something like that. Short of that, carbohydrate would be the smallest macronutrient um, amongst everything that we gather. And that's part of how all this problem begins is that we have a metabolism that's involved to store energy based on this signal. Is there an abundance of that which is least abundant in my environment? So if there is an abundance of carbohydrate, that which is least abundant in my environment, then that is my signal that it's okay to store energy in the form of fat. That's why the whole process is driven by insulin. Because the whole fitness industry and diet industry has in their head that somehow we evolved this little accountant that's sitting up there going, this many calories in, this many calories out, and then tally it up and go, okay, now we'll lose weight. No, if it was that complicated, we never would have survived as a species. Not only that, if we burned as many calories as it says on the treadmill, we never would have survived a hunting and gathering trip. At that rate, you wouldn't survive a trip to the grocery store. It's all predicated on signaling and insulin and signaling. So to answer your question, um, I think we're predominantly, the default position is to be a fat burner, but being in ketosis is not necessarily a marker for that depending on what you're eating. But being in ketosis is not a bad thing. People freak out when they hear ketosis because they think of diabetic ketoacidosis. And what happens there is when you're diabetic, you don't make any insulin, so you're just stacking up a ton of glucose out here that you can't get into the cell. So it's like people in the apartment are calling for pizza over and over and over again. Lots of pizza delivery dudes are coming to the door, but no one can answer the door. So the default then becomes to mobilize body fat, but you have no glucose entering the cell at all, no um, gluconeogenic amino acids to buffet the production of the byproduct of ketone. You have to so aggressively tap this that you actually develop a ketoacidosis, which is a disease state, which is why people freak out when they are in ketosis or hear ketone. Um, so there's that part of the question. The other was, oh, the carb crave. Yeah, okay. So. The problem with uh, the carb crave is that you have kind of beat a metabolic dog trail of this can't go this way, can't go this way, gotta go this way, okay? Well, part of beating this dog trail here is this high energy state produces a lot of an energy byproduct called NADPH. And that's not important to know, but it's a high energy phosphate bond material and that drives metabolic processes that in themselves produce byproducts that interfere with two other hormones that you rely on to tell you when to stop eating, ghrelin and leptin. Leptin is actually produced by your body fat that tells your brain, look, we got enough body fat, it's time to stop. And ghrelin is activated largely by fat through a hormone called cholecystokinin, and it gives you the sensation of fullness in your stomach. Well, the byproducts of doing this over and over again 
affect your ghrelin and leptin sensitivity so it doesn't work as well in the brain. Leptin is there, it's secreted out by your fat cells because fat should, in a proper metabolic state, have a diminishing marginal utility. It does good to have some stored body fat, but at some point the amount stored, the incremental cost of carrying all that around is greater than the potential energy benefit of having it. It's like gypsies. You can only put so much crap in the wagon when the cost of pulling the wagon exceeds the benefit of what's in the wagon. And that's what leptin's trying to do. But the byproducts of that metabolism don't allow leptin to cross the blood-brain barrier. It binds to it, prevents it to cross the blood-brain barrier where it can actually send the message. So you probably have some persistence of that in your own metabolism, because you gotta remember, this is like having a dog in your backyard. Once you beat the dog trails, they don't just fade away automatically. Okay. Ooh. Um, it's working. Okay, great. So my uh, girlfriend is a, a you know, cardio bunny. Uh, she runs a lot, and yeah. uh, I've read the book, and you know, and I really think you've done a great job articulating some of the things that I haven't been able to get Good, across thanks. properly. Thanks. I'm glad. Um, but the, there's just one other thing. We always talk about um, muscular adaptation versus the uh, cardiovascular adaptation, and uh, I've always tried to explain like why muscular is more important. It works more, but I've never been able to get that across because she's always talking about you need more oxygen uptake and VO2 max. And could you just explain the, the difference there and what that's about? I will as best I can. You know what I just realized, Anthony, is I apologize. I have a nervous habit of clicking these pins in all my own videos. I'm just always pissed off because I'm standing there clicking the pen right over the microphone, so I'm going to put this down so I stop doing that at the very end of this whole talk. So hopefully you're able to edit some of that out. But um, to answer your question, um, her question is not even correct, okay, because it's predicated on several false assumptions that are predicated on other false assumptions. and. The biggest false assumption that came out of years of you know, aerobics-based research is that somehow this part of metabolism, the oxygen-using part of metabolism, is somehow uniquely hooked up to the cardiovascular system where the rest of this isn't, okay? But I'm gonna have to pick up the marker again, but I promise not to click it. Um, but the thing is, you gotta realize is that there's physiologically no way that you can take just this part of the metabolism in your cells and have it hooked up to your heart. Everyone thinks that aerobic equals cardiovascular to the extent that we don't have aerobics rooms anymore, we have cardio theaters. Aerobic and cardio has become interchangeable in people's lexicon. It's just not true, because there's no way that you can isolate out this portion of metabolism and have it connected to the heart and the blood vessels. What you gotta realize is that the heart and blood vessels support the, metabol uh, support the entirety of metabolism, this whole thing. And the only way that you can get at this entirety of metabolism, or what I like to call global metabolic conditioning, is by doing mechanical work with muscle. And to the extent that you do a higher quality of mechanical work with muscle, the higher the quality of the cardiovascular stimulus is going to be, okay? Remember what we said, even if we were going to uh, take her assumption that aerobic equals cardio, even if you do this, you can only ramp up cardio maximally if you give it substrate at the fastest rate possible that it can do it. And then afterwards, that gets converted back into substrate and continues to ramp that up. But the bigger issue is that these cardiovascular improvements, the vast, vast majority of them, everyone has it in their head, I do this exercise, and something gets better in my heart and blood vessels. And that's true to some extent, but it's way, way overstated. The vast, vast majority of cardiovascular adaptations that you see, my resting heart rate of 48, is not because of something so much that happened in my heart and blood vessels but rather that is an autonomic, meaning central nervous system automatic, it's an autonomic adjustment to changes that have occurred at the cellular level within the muscle itself, okay? So what you're perceiving is, oh, I got a low resting heart rate and you know, 
my blood pressure's low and my heart rate's low and all that's good markers for health is not really something that's happened here. It's the fact that all these enzymes that make all this happen and these linchpin enzymes that keep the whole process going and lactate dehydrogenase and uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, all those enzymes can upregulate and become more powerful and more efficient. And when that happens, when that's more powerful and more efficient, this has to work less hard. And that's borne out through the parameters that we measure, but it's not because of something that specifically happened there. All right, last question, that it? Uh, totally Guys, thanks so much, it's been an honor. <laughs>